Welcome to Target Market Insights, a multifamily and marketing podcast. Each week, John Kasman interviews multifamily and marketing experts to teach you how to find the best places to invest, attract investors, and grow your portfolio. You are listening to Target Market Insights with your host, John Kasman. Welcome to Target Market Insights, the multifamily marketing show. I'm your host, John Kasman. I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Now, if you're enjoying this show, you've enjoyed all the previous episodes, I need you to do me one quick favor and leave us that five-star rating and review. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And if there's something you want to learn more about, somebody you want us to talk to, just drop us a note, okay? Give us a comment, shoot us a note. Let us know so we can make sure we're delivering the content you need to elevate your business forward. Now, today we're going to be talking to Max Keller. Max is a real estate investor, best-selling author, and highly sought-after consultant, speaker, and expert panelist on the topic of lead generation and marketing for real estate investors. In just a few short years, Max went from being a full-time high school math teacher to flipping over 100 houses. Now, Max's unique marketing approach landed him on stage with Robert Kiyosaki. You might know that name. And uh, he presented, he was presented, I mean, with the 2019 Industry Innovator of the Year Award. Let's welcome to the show, Max Keller. Awesome. John, glad to be here. Max, absolutely. Listen, I went over your bio at a very high level. Why don't you take a couple of minutes and give us a little bit more context? No, you covered everything. <laughs> no, just kidding. Yeah. So, hey, thank you for joining us for this episode. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. Uh, sure. Well, you know, I was a math teacher for seven years. I uh, taught algebra before I got into real estate. And kind of funny story, I really didn't intend to, um, you know, get into real estate full time. I just wanted to, you know, get a couple of rent houses, supplement my income. Uh, my family was growing. And my wife was working at our church. So, you know, our pay was kind of locked in. And I just wanted to get a couple rentals and just, you know, I had been trying to figure out how to do that for a long time. And I guess just for whatever reason, couldn't put the pieces together, but I was at a different stage of my life. And, you know, I got a local um, mentor. I learned, you know, there's, it's, it's easy to learn nowadays, you know, if you're really motivated. And so I um, started investing in 2015 and, you know, my first deal was a, a wholesale deal and had a great you know, five figure profit on it and then started fix and flip and then seller finance and then start doing rentals and retail flips and, you know, nicer neighborhoods. I'm investing here. Um, like I said, the last five years full time in Dallas, Fort Worth um, area. And so I just quit teaching and I started flipping houses and it went really, really good. I really, my strength was never the construction side as much. I mean, uh, good enough to get by, you know, but I was always good at the, at the marketing and the lead gen. Um, you know, the sales, because really three things that we do as business owners, right? We generate leads, we convert leads, and then we have a product or service offering. So the product and service offering was good. You know, the sales, you know, conversion part, it was okay. I mean, I didn't really ever feel comfortable being like a hard closer when I'm across from, you know, the kitchen table. I've read all the books and know what I'm supposed to say, but it just never felt natural, you know, because I was a teacher and I just, I like, just showing people their options and then letting them, them decide what they want to do. And that worked great until about 2017. And then in my market, there was a lot more competition. Uh, I noticed that my return on ad spend was going down. And so my solution was just to spend more money on things that weren't working as well. And, but I am kind of inquisitive, you know, so I was like, okay, what do I, what's the problem here? Like, what's the root cause? And it didn't, fortunately, it didn't take me very long to figure it out. You know, there was just, I was sending out the same messages to every, you know, homeowner on a list that all the other, you know, flippers and wholesalers, you know, were sending to. And so I felt like I needed to take a look at my business because although I was making really good income from compared to being a teacher two years ago, I really wasn't having that much fun. It felt like a hamster wheel. It felt like the, the sellers were in a seller's market and, you know, Dallas Fort Worth at that moment. It felt like they had all the control and as more people entered the market and were kind of like overpaying for deals, in my opinion, um, I just didn't want to get caught up in that. So I wanted a fresh approach. And so what I did, you know, and I think something maybe to consider for you know anybody listening who's done some deals is I went and looked back a little bit at the data. You know, I was always like a visionary. I was always thinking, you know, into the future and I was like, well, what 
let's just take a pause here. Let's, you know, slow down to speed up and let's see exactly what's the situation here. So the first thing I did was I said, well, what's, what kind of deals, like what's important to me? Like if I'm going to do this long-term, it needs to be something that's going to work for me, not for the other people in my masterminds, not for people online for me. And so for me, what's important to me was three things. Number one, I wanted to do deals that had a good profit. I didn't want to do skinny deals because as, as we rep- you know, approached a peak, I knew a lot of people who got washed out in the last recession by doing skinny deals, you know, thin margin deals. So I wanted to do high margin deals. I wanted to do deals where when I gave an offer to somebody, there was minimal resistance. You know, they saw me as the, as the consultant, the expert. And they trusted me. I didn't want to work with people that were arguing with me about how much their house was worth or how much it cost to you know, get it repaired. I just didn't like those. And then the last one is I wanted to have fun. You know, I wanted to work with people that were, you know, that needed some help. I could really help them, add a lot of value to the deal. And we came out with a win-win. And so it's kind of pros and cons. At that point, I think I had done about 60 deals, uh, six zero. And so most of my deals did not meet all three criteria, they'd meet like one or two. But what was good, and this was like my first aha, I really had two marketing ahas in the last five years. The first one was this, is that um, all of the people that were all three of those, so high profit, you know, minimal resistance to my offer, and I had fun actually helping those people, uh, were senior homeowners. So they were, you know, 65 and above. And, and so I was like, okay, um, not a big stretch for me because my grandma uh, helped raise me and then I took care of my grandma. You know, I, I um, drove her to church every Sunday for, you know, 15 years. I mean, I met my wife taking grandma to church. So I always been around old people, you know, like, I mean, my birthday parties, there was all my grandma's friends were there. So I did really like working with those people and um, they needed a lot of help. You know, what I was noticing was, is that, you know, their, their houses were like these little time capsules and they really didn't, they weren't on a lot of the lists that I was targeting, which was really interesting. Cause I'm like, okay, I love seniors. I love my grandma. You know, I love working with people like my grandma. What, how do I get more of them? So I went back and saw how I got those senior leads, the deals that I did. And what I noticed was I wasn't really approaching it systematically. They kind of just, they sort of either, you know, found out about me from, you know, the neighbor, or maybe I was rehabbing a house in that area. So there wasn't like a logical like progression. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I want to go niche, but I'm a little nervous because I, you know, although I was on track to do 30 to 40 deals that year, you know, I felt like the deals were getting harder to find. And if I went niche, then that would make it harder. You know, I would, I'd be working with even less people. So I was, I still had kind of a scarcity mindset at that point. What I found to be the case was the total opposite. What I did instead was, is, um, but I was nervous about it, but I just, I just went all in and I was like, okay, how do I get more senior homeowners? And so I went back and looked at how they found me, you know, originally, those were some clues. Then of course I found some marketing channels, lists, you know, ways of targeting, but the biggest difference wasn't so much the list, it was the message. So I changed my messaging and said, and was speaking directly to senior homeowners and their adult children in my, you know, direct mail, in my emails, in my, you know, digital stuff. And so I would go to these homes and I would notice that, you know, the reason they were more profitable is because a lot of them were cosmetic rehabs. You know, they weren't burnout landlords. These seniors, you know, it wasn't a vacant home. A lot of times they didn't, they weren't late on their mortgage. A lot of times they didn't even have a mortgage. So it's mostly just, you know, high equity lists, you know, live there a long time, that kind of thing. And the other thing I was noticing with the senior homeowners, why it, it worked so good for me, I'm not saying it would work for everybody, but for me, it worked good was because um, I would wholesale some of these houses because a lot of them really didn't need, they needed a cosmetic rehab, but they didn't need all the big stuff. The house was livable. Just everything looked like, you know, Sears catalog, 1978. And so I could wholesale those to a landlord who would pay me a lot more in my market than, you know, somebody who was going to flip it and take it all the way to retail, especially in these houses that were in the, you know, lower blue collar price points, their retail isn't as high. So, you know, you can, and the rent ratio is so much better at the lower price points. So it was, it was like, these were just like an absolute gold mine. So like these seniors were, they needed a lot of help. You know, my grandma passed away in 2011 and 
you know, I remember taking care of her. I was, I majored in finance at UT and I had business jobs before I got into teaching. And so I was the one who was like, you know, paying her bills and she'd have people calling her saying, oh, you know, you know, trying to sell her a reverse mortgage or trying to, you know, sell her realtor services. And she lived by herself and she was, you know, scared. Grandpa died in 87. And so she lived by herself for like another 20, 25 years. So I, she knew that a lot of the folks who were reaching out to her weren't really, didn't really care about her. They just wanted to either take advantage of her or just make money off of her. And so I, I said to myself, you know, I would never do that to a senior. I want to, you know, when I'm, at, I'm working with a senior, it's something I get to do, you know, for them, not to them. And so the business was really booming. The word was starting to get out. My messaging and my marketing was getting better. The niche was working. And what I was finding is these seniors needed like a lot of different kinds of help. So I picked a niche and then I said, okay, well, really like, why do you pick a niche? It's for less competition. Why? Because you can develop a specialty and serve, you know, the people that you're trying to find at a higher level by bringing more, more unique knowledge and more value to the deal. And when you bring more value to the deal, you make more money. And yeah. so, hey, Max, sorry, yeah. I want to, I want to cut in here. I want to make sure we yeah, can recap and make sure everyone can follow uh, your story here. So yeah. just kind of rewinding back a little bit, you know, you, you made that transition from, you know, math teacher really because you were looking for additional income, right? Just yes. trying to supplement your income from there. Right. You were looking at what you're doing. You said a couple things that just jumped out. I want to make sure mm -hmm. our listeners caught these as notes. First and sure. foremost, you talked about business being three things. It's about generating leads, converting leads, and then obviously delivering your product or service. Yeah. And as you looked at that, you were great at generating leads. Mm -hmm. Okay, at the conversion piece. Yeah. Um, and really wanted to figure out how do you get better. Um, you talked right. about the market changing. And I, I want to make sure I illustrate this point because as you look at where the market is today, whether you are looking at multifamily, single family, if you have ever said to yourself, it's really hard to find a deal right now, mm -hmm. you are where Max was. And what Max did was you pivoted mm -hmm. your approach. You looked at the deals you've done. You looked at the ones that are very profitable. You looked at the ones that fit the new criteria that you laid out for yourself, which right. was high profitability, minimum resistance, um, and, and actually fun for you. And that minimum resistance is about actually helping people, you yeah. know, not getting into a bidding war and arguing with somebody and paying the most amount of money, but are you actually adding real value? Right. Are you solving someone's problem? Are you solving their challenge? And that's what you did. So that led you into, you know, what we've been talking about, which is more in the senior space and helping seniors. Right. Um, but that process was really important. So whether you are looking to work with seniors or not, I, I don't think that's the point of what Max was mm -hmm. saying. The point is simply, if you are running into a wall, you may want to step back, reevaluate your criteria. What do you love? What's not working? And how do you readjust those things to actually see success in your business? Now, I want to go back to what you said about kind of your relationship with your grandmother and the, the way you saw other people, other investors trying to pounce on kind of seniors yeah. to try to get their houses and sell. And you talked about the fact that these seniors in particular they need they need other things versus just a good offer on their properties. Please elaborate. Just talk about what are some of those sure. challenges or some of the needs that these senior homeowners have. Yeah, yeah, sure. Great question. So, well, it was a lot. So the first one was is that they need to work with somebody they can trust. And so what was happening was is these seniors were having a change in their health situation, or you know their you know husband or spouse like passed away, and they've lived in their house a long time and. A lot of my homeowners weren't, you know, independently wealthy. So they didn't have, you know, CPAs and attorneys, you know, in their phone. They, they were folks that, you know, worked at the school with me, you know, and they were, you know, drove a bus and they had a little pension and they had, you know, a little social security. Their house was paid off or mostly paid off. And that's like all the money they had pretty much for their retirement that they had to live on. And so some of the things that they needed was they needed somebody to objectively tell them like how much their house was worth. And so what would happen is, is that they would go, they would call an investor to see how much the house was worth. And the investor would tell them why they're the best investor and why realtors don't know anything and they should pick me, you know, them. And then the, they call a realtor and the realtor would say how investors are scum of the earth and why they're the best realtor and they have the most letters at the end of their name on their business card. And then they call an assisted living facility to try to figure out somewhere else to live because the house is too much 
to keep up with and mobility wise, they need somebody to keep an eye on them. And they're, and maybe their kids are now like spread out all over the country and they've got their own families to raise. So, you know, just imagine like, you know, Mavis and she's worked her whole life, raised a family, you know, married, you know, kept the house up. And then for the last 10 years, she's been by herself. Her kids are busy. You know, things are changing and happening so fast. And there's all these sophisticated people coming at her with all these offers. And she's, she just knows that she has to do something and she just doesn't know who to trust. And so what I did was I figured out what my, what did the same thing I did with my students. So when I was an algebra teacher, I worked at an inner city school. So there's a starting line and a finish line. And we're trying to get somebody to a finish line. Well, you have to know, you know, where they're at so you can meet them where they're at and then what it is that they're going to need to get to the finish line. And it was the same thing with these seniors. They needed, you know, a lot of different help and information. So most of it I knew, especially on the house buying side. But on the senior housing side, you know, I knew a little bit of it, but I didn't know everything. So I didn't let that stop me. And I just went and learned. So I called a bunch of assisted living facilities. I called a bunch of nursing homes. I, I started learning the industry. And pretty quickly, um, you know, I was, I'd say probably in the top 95%, you know, of, or, you know, the top 5% of, um, of um, you know, knowing, knowing, kind of being like the senior housing guy in that area just by going and talking, just, I don't know, a little extra effort. And so it was really paying off. You know, I would sometimes connect seniors to, you know, things that didn't point directly back to me income wise. And I know for a fact that that kind of trust um, is what got me so many referrals and got me so much business. And, you know, sometimes I was buying houses and somebody else was offering a lot more money for the house than me, but they sold the house to me instead. And so I had to figure out why that kept happening. So I called one of the um, motivated sellers. It was the son, the adult son of the mom. And I bought um, their house and then I helped her find another place to live. I didn't charge anything for that. It's just part of my service. And I asked the son, I said, hey, do you remember me, Max, you know, Savior home buyers, uh, like our Lord and Savior? And he said, yeah, I remember you. And I said, well, cool. Hey, weird question. Um, I think like, you know, six months ago when you sold me, you know, your mom's house, you said you got a higher offer. Um, was that true? And he's like, yeah. And, and then we talked about the details and I kind of had it right. And I said, well, just curious, like, I'm glad you work with me, but why did you, um, you know, decide to, you know, go with me when you had a higher offer? And he said, it was, you know, because we, we trusted you, you know, we felt like when you went over to our, you know, the house, you genuinely cared about, you know, my mom, you cared about us, you were connecting us to stuff that, you know, didn't, you know, point back to you. And we felt like you would have helped us whether you made money or not. And the other people were just like, you know, your house is a piece of junk. You know, when are you going to hurry up and sign the contract? You know, they never met with us. It, everything was just over the phone. And so they just felt like, you know, that, that was worth it to them. And so I felt like I had really found the right place to be. And so I knew I was in the right niche. And then the second idea that I got was from a motivated seller. You know, you learn more when you listen. And so I was buying a house and um, the daughter of the homeowner was like, hey, you know, you really helped our family out a lot. We really appreciate you and everybody on your team. You had an office of like four or five people. A couple of people were helping me buy and then contract, you know, project, you know, coordinator and stuff like that. And so she said, you know, you know a lot about the senior housing stuff and you're kind of a natural teacher. Um, have you ever thought about writing a book about this? Because I, she had to take a lot of notes when I was writing. And she's like, man, I would have loved, like, I would have read your book cover to cover. And I was like, no, I don't think so. I'm like, I was a math teacher, you know, not an English teacher. I'm actually dyslexic. Um, and I didn't find that out until I was an adult. Um, I knew I always struggled to read, but I didn't really know why. And so um, just barely scraped through school and, um, you know, got with a coach, started reading really better once I got into real estate and found out everybody reads apparently who's got shows and, you know, doing really well. So I had to figure it out. And I did, but I still wasn't, I never saw myself as a writer, you know, and I'm instantly thinking about, well, like Robert Kiyosaki, he wrote a bunch of books, you know, and people like that. And I'm like, no, I'm not like those guys. And then I thought about it. And I was like, you know, that's actually a pretty good idea. So I dismissed it at first. And then when I thought about it, I was like, you know, it's a pretty good idea. I could change the, the positioning from the guy who knows a lot about senior housing, which, you know, my customer said I was to the person who wrote the book on senior housing. And so what I did was I created a very simple 
how to book and it's a it's a how to lead generation book and all it is is i just wrote down all the questions that i had been asked on the you know 1978 floral couches that i was sitting on you know for 3 or 4 hours sometimes you know that's the tough part is like if you don't have a book i'm repeating the same stories over and over and over again and you know my seniors love me but there's still a lot of customers who just saw me as a salesperson you know cuz they're seeing all the ads, they're getting all the postcards. And it's just, it was really hard to stand out, sometimes even within the niche. And so what I did was I just wrote down all the questions I've been asked, I put the answers to them, I put the pros and the cons, and I, I created a, a book that kind of covered that whole kind of journey I was telling you about, the question you asked, all the different challenges they had. And each chapter was about a different challenge. And I just, so I wrote it, you know, I shut down parts of my business for a couple of months. It, if I had known how long it was going to take, I probably wouldn't have done it, but um, I did it and then it was done after about, you know, a couple hundred hours. And then I printed out a hundred copies and start giving it out, you know, as my new business card. And it, it led to a lot of other things that were totally unexpected. Um, but it's been an amazing way to market my business and, you know, just the most fun I've ever had, you know, marketing. Yeah, Max, that's amazing, right? I love the quote you said. You said, why not go from, um, you know, why don't you become the person who wrote the book on senior mm -hmm. housing, right? Going from the person who knows a lot about this right. topic to the person who wrote the book on this topic. And mm -hmm. that's a great way to build credibility yeah. and to build that connection with someone because now you have something that you can hand them. And that's it's a way to disarm people too, right? I mean, you're talking yes. about people who are, you know, in a way distrusting because that's how everyone has approached them. You know, they're 100%. almost like vultures trying to yes. come and take their properties. So, you know, to have a book where they can actually learn, listen to stories from other people, get mm -hmm. the knowledge that they're looking for, it actually is a great win-win scenario. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you talked about that transition, you know, some of the challenges you faced in in writing the book and it taking a lot longer, you know, I want to just talk broadly and I actually want to wind back a little bit here. Sure. You know, earlier in our conversation, you talked about being really good at lead generation, mm -hmm. right? And I think it all starts with that and prospecting, having some leads and then being able to refine. Let's just go back from a lead generation standpoint. You know, what are some things that you did really well and maybe some things where you learned some lessons to be able to generate more leads for your business. Sure. Uh, I think the thing that I did the best, you know, or one thing that just, I know stands out in my mind was investing in my marketing. So I never was in, afraid to do that. Um, you know, there's really two ways to get deals, right? It's time or money. And then there's some unique knowledge that involves both. And so one of the best things that I did that I'm proud of myself for doing was, you know, when I got my first wholesale deal and it was, you know, deep in the five figures, which was four months of teacher pay, I joined a mastermind and everybody else in there had like 70 rent houses and had been doing it like 10 years. And I was like the only new person, but I did, I just, I, I, I got good, you know, mentorship from them and I listened to what they said and then I went and executed it. And so that, that is huge because without execution, nothing happens. And so, and now, like I said, I just wasn't afraid when I got money from a deal to put it back out there because I felt like I was going to get, you know, six, seven, eight X on my marketing. So I want to put as much out as I can. So I was never afraid to do that. That helped. The lesson that I um, learned that, you know, the mistakes that I've made is a million. We don't have time for all of them. But one of them was, yeah, not going niche sooner. But the other one was not really having a good follow up system. So what would happen was I would invest in my marketing, but if my, you know, if my postcard, if my digital piece, if whatever it is that I was investing in wasn't right in front of the homeowner when they needed to make a decision, you know, I was very forgettable. And then when I started getting my book in people's hands, you know, we have a whole progression that we use. And now we have students that license our content all over the country. Never would have thought that happened in a million years. I mean, like this is, I'm still sort of in disbelief. I'm like pinching myself. But, but being um, rememberable is huge because most people don't go to your website and then, you know, have you come over to the house and do a deal with you. That's a really, really small percentage of the people. And so all, you know, I, I encountered these benefits with a book that sort of fixed my, my deficits in those areas. And I didn't know they would. So, you know, if we have time, I can jump into just a few case studies of what happened, you know, with that. And like I said, they're really unexpected surprises that fix a lot of those issues 
if people are struggling with, you know, follow up and standing out and being there at the right time. Yeah, no, I love that, man. I'll definitely see if we have time to come back to that because I think that's very helpful and something that yeah. most people in business struggle with, you know, kind of mm -hmm. making sure that as you are generating those leads that you're right. you're keeping them warm, you're nurturing those leads, right? Are you staying in front of people, especially in your business because you never know when someone's ready to sell their house and mm -hmm. they don't know, you know, it could be, you know, they just wake up one day and, uh, or maybe they get a bill or whatever the case would be. They just decide today's the day and yep. they're going to go with whatever's in front of them. Uh, they're not necessarily going to remember the postcard they got from you five months ago, especially if that was the last time they heard from you. Um, right. Speaking of lead generation, right? You talked about how powerful the book has been for you, you know, yeah. sitting down, writing this book, you passed it out to a hundred people and actually saw some great results there. You know, there are folks who are looking at what we call, you know, thought leadership or lead generation pieces. And there are a lot of different ways to do lead gen, right? Um, why a book? And let's just compare it to maybe a blog, right? I mean, blogs are great ways to get in front of people. Why a book or what, what advantages does a book have over something like a blog? Yeah, great question. So scientifically, you know, there's an article that we can link to that I'll send you in the Harvard Gazette um, where they talked about um, they, they did the scientific study and they, the person was evaluating different resumes to see who would be a good candidate for a job. And what they noticed was is that the candidate's resume that was on a heavier clipboard, heavier in weight, those, those researchers or those people in the study found those folks to be, that candidate's resume to be a more serious, a better resume, more qualified for the position. And it was solely based on the weight of the clipboard. So there's a psych, there's people in my circles that are saying that, that tactile, you know, communication is the new, is the new really untapped, you know, future of, of marketing. Um, you know, our tactile, our senses are developed before we can even speak you know, when we reach out for our, our mother's hand. And so that what's happening when somebody gets a physical book with weight to it is these, these you know, subconscious responses that are lie very, very deep into our brainstem. And so eBooks are great. I've done them. You know, blogs are great. They just don't have the same level of, um, of credibility, trust, and expertise in the mind of our prospect as a book does. Um, so it's physical weight. It's also about the amount of value. Um, so, you know, in a book, you can basically take the summation of a lot of blog posts, put it together. And what we have in our system, I call it coffee table follow-up. So I used to, um, the old way of doing marketing was I used to put bandit signs all over our city and then, you know, little signs in the ground, I'll buy your house. And then I had people who did it for me. You know, now, um, I have bandit signs and they're in my prospects living rooms because when I give them a signed copy of my book, they, they value it, they cherish it. They put it next to all the other autographed copies of a book that they've been you know, given, which may not be a lot. And so it's on the coffee table. And so there's a physical touch point. You know, so I'm in thousands of living rooms here in DFW. So whenever they're ready to sell, it's going to be very easy for, for me to be, um, you know, rememberable. But, but those other items are great, and people do go to the website to do research. And what's kind of cool is, is a lot of people go blog or ebook and think book is too hard. It's actually easier for, to go book first because then you have all the content for the rest of your career that you would ever need. So you just kind of do it once. And, um, and there's two ways to write a book. A lot of people are intimidated by it. So just in 60 seconds, I'll just kind of break this down. You know, there's, there's the DIY and the ROI. And so a DIY is the investor that likes to get their hands dirty, solopreneur. They like to do, you know, all the different parts of the deal. You know, it's a little more trial and error. It takes a little longer to get an ROI. But if you like that style, there's nothing wrong with that. And so we created the Real Estate Investor Book Writing Checklist. And I'm going to give your audience uh, who stays at the end a link where they can download a copy of that. And it breaks down, it's basically the guide I wish I had when I was writing my first book. And it talks about how to put it in a logical order because most of y'all already have the, the knowledge, whether you're in real estate or you're just a business owner, you, you have the knowledge because you're answering these questions over and over again. So this book, which we normally charge for, but for a limited time, we'll offer it for free to your audience, um, allows you to really have the framework to where you can you know, collect your thoughts, whether it's for a book or an ebook or just improve your website. People are doing research before they make decisions. 
And, um, you know, like I said, we have eBooks, all of our students and myself, we give our a digital flip book to all of our prospects and they're good. It's just when you send something via email, you know, it gets, it gets caught up in however many emails are in their inbox. It's just a little harder to stand out and the perceived value isn't as high. But when I give somebody my book and it says $12.99 on the back or one of my students who licenses our content does that and it says $12.99 on the back, there's just a perceived value that's at a totally different level and, and uh, most of the competition, you know, doesn't have one either. So it's great. And then for the R or for the, that's DIY. And then for ROI, um, the fastest way, you know, for people who are just like Max, I just want to get by deals and, and get more dollars for the business, everything else I get a team to do. We have some licensed content that investors plug into. And so for about an hour of their time, we have everything that we need to create their book in less than 30 days. So, but either way is good, but you know, books can be a powerful tool and it's just something to consider. Listen, I, th- I think what you just said makes so much sense because, you know, books can be powerful. And, um, you know, we, we had a, a guest on earlier on in the podcast and mm-hmm. you, we talked about the book being the new business card. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, if you go to a networking event or you're out there connecting with people and they give you a business card, well, a lot of times those business cards either end up in a pile somewhere or in the trash. And yeah. it's not like you can remember specifically, oh, who's that guy I met at that one event and he was talking about, you know, investing in senior homes. Like it's not as easy to to be able to dig that up and have it. But a book, as you stated, it's gonna be on a coffee table, it's gonna be on a bookshelf, and you're gonna see it frequently. So that moment when you have that need and it triggers, or even if it's not you, if it's someone else you know right. who's in a situation, you can say, Hey, you know what? You should talk to this guy or reach out to this guy. And uh, maybe he can help. So that book can be very powerful. Um, and I love your point about the book being physical because while an ebook, the same content is great as an ebook, it's just in the digital world. You know, it's, it's caught up in your email, it's caught up on your desktop somewhere, tucked away. It's not as readily available uh, versus, you know, having that physical copy where you can see it on your shelf or see it on your cocktail table. So really powerful insults, uh, uh, insights there, not insults, insights. <laughs> sure. So, hey, Max, you know, you know, as, as I'm thinking about this, there's someone who's saying, that sounds great, but I'm not ready to write a book. You know, I, I haven't accomplished enough to write a book. I know some stuff, but certainly I'm not the expert. What do you say to those people? That's a great question. Well, I was one of them. Um, that's that was my initial fears and worries, and I think that's totally normal. The way that we um, the way that we approach that is, you know, an expert is not is not the same thing as you know somebody who knows more than you know. There, that's not like it doesn't have to be like the person who knows the most about a subject, like in the whole world. You know, like I'll give you an example. Uh, Dave Ramsey, you know, the financial guy, um, is he an expert? Yeah, I think most people would probably say he's an expert in financial, personal finance, you know, but does he know the most about investing out of anybody in the whole world? No. You know, does he know more than everybody else? Not really. Does he run around calling himself an expert? No. But what he does is he's always, he's, he's made himself out there and available and he's, you know, he's teaching and he's advocating. And that's really what an expert is. Edu- an expert is somebody who educates and advocates for their prospect. It's somebody who knows more than their prospect, right? That is the subject matter expert, right? In relation to the person they're serving. And they're, um, but they're putting themselves out there and they can look the prospect in the eye and say, hey, uh, I'm here to give you some info, okay? I have a lot of info that I can share and I'm advocating for you in this deal too. And I'm gonna make sure that you win also. So it's a true win-win. So to me, that's really what an expert is because if you have a lot of knowledge, but you're not sharing it with anybody, you're not really adding value to anybody else's life but yourself. So true expert and expertise doesn't have to be somebody who has millions of deals. I mean, we have students that you know are, are newer to the industry, but they have the heart of a teacher. They're more into just you know sharing what they do and attracting their ideal prospect, depending on what niche they go into, um, versus trying to like you know be a hunter. Because there's two ways to, to get, you know, convert leads. There's hunting and there's trapping. So some people are hunters. They like the thrill of the chase. They like trying to sort of like going deep sea fishing and spending three hours, like trying to reel a a big fish on the boat. 
you know, you can do that. People do it all the time. It's just really exhausting. I don't like that method. I never liked the high pressure thing. It was always a big turnoff to me. So my method is I'm a trapper. Okay. So I just share what I do. And then, um, and then I attract the people who are interested and then they become, you know, customers. And so it's just a totally different way of looking at it. But, um, you know, so it's, it's more about educating and advocating than it is about being the one person in the world who knows the most. No, Max, I, I really love the way you, you brought that to life, you know, especially with your education background. You know, it's the difference between being an expert, and being an educator. You do not have to be the expert, but you just have to focus on educating those people. And, and let's go back to what you just said. You know, you're an algebra teacher. That doesn't mean you are the world renowned expert on the subject of algebra or all math equations. It just meant that you were in a position to educate those people who you knew more than so they could really rise up and learn more about that subject. And think about that, you know, if you are positioning yourself, especially if you're looking to connect with friends and family and other people, it's really about educating them on their options. And the thing I love most about even this podcast or creating content is it forces you to actually learn even more. You know, if you're going to be in a position where you're starting to educate other people, now you've got to do more research. Now you have to have guests like this and have these conversations. Right. And you're going to be more savvy. You're going to be more intelligent. You're going to be more educated. So it kind of is a system that allows you to better serve those people you're looking to help. So it's not about being the expert. Don't worry about being you know, better than me or, or you or anyone else for that matter. It really is about the people you're talking to. Can you add value to those people with what you do know? And if so, now you're in a position to help them. Max, I want to move on a little bit and talk about your publishing company a little bit more because you now help other people. You've kind of mentioned that, you know, you have two options where you could help other people write books. Talk to me about the publishing company and a little bit more about, you know, the opportunities that there are for people to write their own books. Yeah, sure. So like I said, if you're a DIY, um, download a copy of the, of the book. We'll put the link at the bottom. And I'll just say it right now. If that's just so I don't forget, it's, uh, is that okay? Yes, they, please. They can go to deals, uh, chasing you.com forward slash uh, J Kason, Caseman, Caseman, C A S M O N. So J C A S M O N, and they can download a copy. So for that, it breaks down the structure of how to write a book. And, you know, it doesn't have to be like a huge book to start out with. Um, and you can start with an ebook. It's just about creating something um, that is truly valuable because a lot of what's out there in marketing has no value. It's, it's all it is, is just, it's information about you. All it is, is the, you know, the attention part of, of the whole, you know, marketing cycle. So you're getting, you're getting attention, you know, awareness, you're getting some appeal, but there's not really any valuable content in it. It's just a sales letter and there's nothing wrong with those. So like one of the things that we do in our marketing is that we, we have sales letters, we have probate letters, we have things like that, but then we add a transitional call to action to capture the largest amount of people which is the people who aren't ready right now. And it says, hey, if you're not ready to do anything, but you want to avoid making big mistakes in this area, we wrote this book. You can go online and buy it, or you can call our office. We'll send you a copy. And then, and so that really, so that's increased our, um, you know, our response rate, three, four, five X for us and our students. And so those are kind of like the strategies. So I noticed a couple of things with books. One is my friends who had books, a lot of them were more about themselves than they were about solving the biggest problems of their ideal prospect. So they were written for the purpose of like to say you have a book, which my books are not. They're solely for the purpose to attract more motivated sellers or to attract more private money lenders. That's it. Um, that's the only goal. So it's like half a percentage about me or my students, um, and then ninety nine percent about you know them and teaching them. And um, and so. Yeah, so for the ROI side, we have some different uh, licensed content that people plug into. And it's, I think we're, you know, the only people really who have done this in the real estate investing space. But it's a pretty simple process. You know, folks who decide that they don't want to write their own book, but they want to plug into it. We take our uh, master copy and we just customize it. We write them into it. We create essentially like a local edition. And then the other part, so they can give it out as their new business card. And that's sort of like version 1.0. And you will get gains. You know, you can get gains if you pass it out. You have to do some work, but, you know, it, it works if you work it. So there's sort of gains from that. And the other part that I noticed was I had a lot of friends who 
had gotten books and they had done books, but they didn't know how to market them. They didn't understand how to, because there's two ways to market your lead generation book. One is to attach it to the existing marketing that you're already doing to make it more powerful. Just like I was saying with getting higher conversion rate or more phone calls, um, because you're standing out, you're different, you're adding more value, you're providing something unique, you're providing something that causes less, you know, um, of a, of a response needed from the person, you know, they don't have to invite you over to their home to take the next step in the buyer's journey. So that's a huge benefit on its own. But then the, another benefit with having a book is opening up some channels that normally are only available to people who have a book. And that's like getting on local radio, getting on local TV. You know, um, I'll give you an example of, of two ways. So attaching to our original marketing, um, so that's what we teach our students how to do. I didn't get to finish, sorry. But that's what we teach our students how to do is um, is how to do that. So they have a weekly call that they come on to. All the students on our network come on to it and, um, and they're you know licensing different types of content. And we talk about how to actually put it in action because just like I wanted you know the best possible outcome for my senior homeowner and still do, even if it means not working with me, um, I want the same thing for my students. I want I don't want to just sell them a book and then it does nothing because I have two purposes. One is to have a successful publishing company, which we do, but the other is to help a lot of seniors because I figured out in a lot of private money lenders, which is our other licensed content, because I've noticed that um, I just I couldn't figure out a distribution model to you know be in Connecticut and then be in Washington and sit at the coffee table and it teach these people this stuff that really will help them stay out of a jam and not get, you know, hoodwinked or bamboozled by some, you know, unscrupulous person. But through a network of local experts all over the nation, we have these trusted advisors that are all over the country, you know, with their book, their customized edition, and they're having those conversations. And, um, and so, so that's been cool. And, uh, but yeah, so like, like I said, people attach it to what they're already doing, which is what I did when I, first start passing out my book, I just told people about it. And one of the things that happened that was an unexpected benefit was I get motivated sellers calling me and sometimes they didn't know I had a book yet. And so they go, they go, Oh, Hey, can you come over like right now? And you know, they felt like, you know, there's 500 investors, I'm a dime a dozen and they, they have the cheese. And if I want the cheese, I'm going to have to pay them for it. And they're calling all the shots. And so one of the ways I was able to reverse that whole paradigm in a seller's market, and turn it basically into a buyer's market for me. But they say, whoa, 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 hit the brakes. Have you got a copy of my book yet? And they're like, your book? And it just like, it was like the record stopped. You know, and they're like, no, I didn't know about that. I'm like, yeah, well, we wrote the book on senior housing. But even if you're not a senior, chapter three is all the ways to sell your house, pros and cons of each. And I wouldn't want you to make any mistakes because this is obviously a big decision. You don't know me yet. So let me ask you a question. If I sent you over an autographed copy of my book via courier to you today, would you read it, be, read chapter three before I came over? Because if you will, then I'll come over. And if not, then I'm not coming over. Because you trying to chase every deal doesn't work. It goes back to just trying to just, you know, reel every single fish on the boat. You want the fish, you ever seen that video where the fish jump on the boat? Yep. Like there's this, yeah, you want that. So how do you do that? Just be, have the right bait, <laughs> be real selective, set the rules of the game at the beginning so you don't go down these three hour wastes of times. That's what I was doing, right? So they're like, uh, uh, sure. And I'm like, well, do you really need me to come over like right the second? They're like, no, not really. I'm like, okay, well, how about I come over in a couple of days and then we'll talk. We'll have a good conversation. And they're like, okay. So I send the book and this is what happens. The other people that they already called who do not have a book, they call them back and tell them, well, I don't need you to come over anymore. And then the other people that they were going to call, they don't call because why would they call anybody else when they already have the person who wrote the book on the subject? And so then when I go over there, they've already read chapter three. They've already read my story. They saw the picture of me and my Momo on our 90th birthday in the book. And they're like, this is a high quality person. This is somebody I'm comfortable with. And then, so, and they've invested four or five hours reading it without me having to be there. So it has a, a real time scale to it. Um, and then I go over there, I bring them a copy of the workbook, you know, I'm bringing gifts, I'm tapping into the law of reciprocity, you know, I'm tapping into all of these psychological laws to get more of what I want, but I'm doing it in a way that still benefits them. And so that's a way where I didn't have to change anything, same people, same phone calls, but by being pre-sold before I walk into the living room, now I'm not interviewing for deals. Now I'm not going, 
Now that they're not saying, oh, well, there's somebody else coming right after you and then somebody after them, take a number. I mean, I've been to those things before. And that goes back to number three on my list, which was not having fun and resistance to the offer. And usually when there's a lot of people in the deal, the profit gets skinnier. So I can do less deals and make more money because my deals are fatter because I have more exclusives. My students have more exclusives. And, and the reason we're making more is not because we're using all of these closing strategies on little old ladies. It's because we're adding more value to the deal. And that's, that's a, it feels good to get paid that way. Max, I mean, that's powerful insights, right? And again, even if you're not looking at senior housing or you're looking at single families in general, what you're saying at a macro business level right. is add value to people, create mm -hmm. your authority, create your credibility so that it precedes you. Even yeah. if people don't know, you can then share that information with them, which is going to make it easier for you to do business. You don't want to be convincing people mm -hmm. to work with you. You want to quickly and author authoritatively establish yourself as someone who has the credibility to do whatever it is that you do in your business. So great tips and insights right there. We'll make sure we link to, to uh, the free offer you have, dealschasingyou.com backslash J-C-A-S-M-O-N. Um, Max, are you ready to move on to our bulls around? Let's do it. Max, give me a failure or an apparent failure that set you up for later success. Mm, the first failure would be trying to serve everybody. I'm a people pleaser. So I wanted, I've always been that way my whole life. I wanted people to like me. Kind of because I was real short growing up and I had dyslexia, so I didn't feel that good all the time. So I wanted to make people like me. I tried to make jokes and I just, I, I would try to do that in my home buying business. I was trying to like serve and take care of everybody. It was almost like an ego thing. You know, I'm in a big city and it's huge. It's like 70 miles by 70 miles, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth. And I was like, I'm taking down every house. And that was a huge mistake because I never knew the neighborhoods. I never really had the marketing to really support that kind of wide net. And so I wanted to have a wide net to go big. And I even went to another state and started flipping houses. And then the craziest thing is that when I went super hyper local and super niche and really drilled down and built digital and physical resources to support that business, it, it turned out to be more profitable than when I tried to go wide. So. I wish I had done that sooner. Really found my niche and really focused in, uh, on what it is I was trying to get more of. And I think it, it would have been more successful even sooner. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Well, I like using PropStream to pull this. You know, some of their data refreshes at different rates, but for my purposes, it works, you know, really, really well. And then, um, so you said a digital and then, or what else? Digital or mobile, prop stream is fine. That's a, yeah, that's a good I like one. that one. That's good. Yeah. Give me the book outside of one of your own. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. Yeah, my favorite is Deep Work by Cal Newport, and it talks about the power of um, how to how to enter, how to communicate with complicated uh, people who are going to be successful in the 21st century. Have to have one of three things: they have to be the top, you know, five or one percent of their profession or they have to be able to interact with complicated machines, or three, they have to be able to do deep work, which is concentrating on something, you know, for long periods of time. And so learning how to concentrate has by far been the number one uh, game changer in my professional and personal life. It teaches what's you one, how to do that. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were starting out? Reading, um, because I didn't know I was dyslexic till I was an adult, um, I just, thought I just wasn't interested in reading and couldn't figure out why the words were all moving around. I thought I just had vision problems. So I wish I had learned that I was dyslexic sooner because I would have started reading sooner because now I read a lot and I love it. And reading really opens up everything. And um, I find that there's almost like a direct connection between how successful somebody is and how much they read. And so I'm a big fan. What's a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals? There's a few of them. The one, the daily habit that keeps me uh, focused on my goals is the, actually the one that I do the day before. So I'll review the day and then I do something called keep change delete, where I look back and reflect on my day and say, okay, what is it that I did that I wanna do, do again? What do I need to change or tweak? And then what do I need to like totally delete, you know, out of my repertoire 
you know, Warren Buffett said that if you increase, you know, 1%, get 1% better every day, you know, that's, that's huge gain. So doing that kind of ritual has, um, you know, made a big difference for me. What are you curious about right now? Digital marketing. You know, I have a media group. I, I do that for some of my students and uh, for myself. And it's sort of like, um, I don't know what it's like. It's like never ending and you can make it, there's like limitless possibilities. So I really like the, I really like taking the physical world and the digital and putting them together. So I see some people that are really good with physical stuff marketing. And I see some people that are great with digital, but sometimes there's, um, uh, I don't see as many people really focus on like omnipresence. So one of the things that we're really into is like, we're sending out very targeted you know, um, uh, postcards and letters um, to our lists and we're stacking a lot of data, but then we're also offering them the physical book. And then we're using the digital space, uploading their information, uploading those emails to create custom audiences and then retarget them. And so it's sort of like being, instead of just sending them one thing, um, kind of being everywhere. And then how, which is, it's easy to conceptualize, but it's more challenging to implement. So we're building out our agency, those checklists to just keep getting you know better and better at that, make the messages very specific. But digital and physical put together is probably where the future is because digital is not gonna go away, but people still, you know, read, you know, people still have tactile senses, which influences their behaviors. So putting those together is the frontier that we're on. All right, Max, you're in DFW, so Dallas, Fort Worth. Give me the yes. best place to grab a bite to eat. I don't know. I, I have a lot of kids, so I stay home a lot. Um, just something barbecue. You know, we're kind of known for barbecue in Texas. So just if you go know, barbecue, you'll probably be okay. There you go. Any good old barbecue spot in Dallas, you probably are, be all right. So good. Okay. All right, Max, um, you gave us a lot of great information, man. I love hearing your story about, you know, one, just doing direct mail, getting your list together, having success, flipping houses, but realizing, you know, this isn't quite as fun as I really want it to be. Mm -hmm. Making that pivot, focusing on seniors in particular, and then ultimately becoming kind of the, the educator in the space writing the book on senior housing and how to help these seniors, helping them with all the information that they need to make that transition, um, and then helping other people with your publishing company. For those folks who want to learn more about you, what is the best way to reach out? Yeah, you just go to our website, uh, dealschasingyou.com, and um, all of our contact info is on there. You can go to our Facebook page, uh, which is the same, dealschasingyou.com, uh, or if you or you can check out our home buying business too, Savior, uh, like our Lord and Savior Home Buyers, and that's um, online and on Facebook. And yeah, just feel free to reach out, but get a copy of the book if you want to, you know, have, just put your best foot forward and have a better message with your, you know, your clients and prospects, um, whether it's your website or direct mail, or you want to write a book, um, you know, if you go to dealschasingyou.com forward slash uh, J A. Uh, or J C A S M O N. There's the dyslexia. Yep. I don't stop. Uh, <laughs> check good, it man. out, and it's good to go. But yeah, excellent. Um, it's, excellent. it's easy to reach me. Excellent, Max. We'll make sure we drop those links here um, in the the show notes as well. Thank you for coming on Target Market Insights, the multifamily marketing show. Hope you have a great day. We'll talk again soon. Take care. Take care.